oppression. And it has four parts to it. First part is unequal distribution of power. Second one is unequal distribution of wealth. The third one is an ethnocentric culture, which is self-centered. This promotes nationality. This promotes division of people instead of bringing people together. And the fourth one is unfair policies and practices. So these are basically your laws. Now, it doesn't matter what system of government, it doesn't matter what system in the world, it's all based upon this system. One of my favorite definitions of insanity is that doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And this is what it is, it's insanity. We keep on pushing this system on the world's people. We keep on pushing it down their throat saying this is the way. This is the correct way. And we're wrong. Now, there is a system. There is a system that was created by the creator for the creation. Injustice. It was the first system that was created for mankind. And this system, it governs laws, it governs institutions, it governs economics, and it brings justice in between. There's a balance in between. So we don't have the Occupy movement where 99% are in economic slavery and 1% eat everybody's wealth. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. But this is what we are faced with. Now there is a solution. But it's gonna take human beings to realize that I've had enough of this system to say there's gotta be something else. And it's gonna happen because people are sick and tired of being in abject poverty. They're sick and tired of seeing people oppressed. They're sick and tired of seeing women, children, innocent people being killed in an effort to say that we're trying to protect freedom. This is wrong. This is injustice. And I ask each and every single one of you to look, who is the aggressor? Who is the aggressive one towards these people? And don't think that if we don't stand up for it here in America, if we don't stand up for it against this, if we do not speak out against it happening to people in other countries, we're just as guilty as the one pulling the trigger and dropping the bomb. And this is true. And we have to get up we have to stand up, we have to speak out against the system, and we have to educate people that they don't have to live this way if they don't want to. And this will bring about change. This is true change. This ain't Obama change. This is real change. And it starts with the people, because the people are the power. The people are the power. And if they speak out against this, against the 1%, the people that are holding this system of oppression, you'll see many things change. Many things will change. Now, many of you are going to be deceived by media about another system. You're going to be told that this system promotes violence. This system promotes killing innocent lives. Okay? And I'm here to tell you that that system, that system that I adopted, does not promote any of that. And in fact, in fact, it is the only place where three million people a year come and gather from different countries, different nations, different tribes, different skin colors to come and worship one God. That's bringing people together. They don't care which country you are. They don't care how much wealth you have. They don't care how poor you are. They're all right next to one another. True brotherhood and sisterhood in humanity. And this is important because there is a constant effort by the media to go ahead and disparage this, to go ahead and hide this, so you do not get this message. And I invite every single person here and every single person around the world to find out what this message was. It's not something new. It's not something that was given to the Arabs. It's not something that was given to people in the Middle East. This is something that was given down since the very first man was created. And this is a guide to get mankind back to what is important in life and to make them noble human beings. And so I encourage you and I challenge you to at least pick up the Quran, read it. At least you'll be able to make up your own decision if that is what it teaches. And I guarantee you, when you look into this book, when you look into the teaching, you will see inside of your own religions, you will see inside of your own selves that it's the same system, the same system. 
And it's only this system, when we go back to this system, are we going to be able to get rid of this oppression, this system. Thank you very much. I will take any questions on this. Also, um, I have cards over there. If anyone would like a free copy of the Quran, I will mail you one. Uh, I will send you DVDs. I'll, I'll give you any kind of information you like. Um, I, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy talking to people. And I'll let people ask questions because I, I'm sure you can have some questions that for me, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you a question. No, if anyone wants to ask a question. Anyone would like to ask you a question? <laughs> what made you decide to convert to being a, yeah. Yes, yes. And, and in fact, uh, there's a whole YouTube world story about it, but that's a whole other story. Uh, I was in the U.S. Navy, and uh, I met a woman from another country. Uh, she came to me one day, and she was crying, and she said, my parents are trying to force me to marry someone from my home country, and I don't want to marry. I said, no problem, I'll go ahead and marry you. And she said, great. The only thing, the only thing is you have to become a Muslim. I said, great. What is a Muslim? <laughs> I grew up in a little small farm town. I had no exposure to even ethnicity. I, I remember when I was in high school, it was the very first African American guy that came to our town. I mean, it was the, the buzz of the whole entire town. I mean, that's where I grew up at. And so I wasn't exposed to many different diversity, many different, different ethnicities, and so I was clueless. So she basically said, all you have to do is go recite after this guy and you're a Muslim. I said, okay, that it? So I went down there, I recited after the guy, and then boom, I'm a Muslim. But it took me many years to realize that what I did was I, I testified of faith, it's called the Shahada, that there is no God but one God, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a messenger just like Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the others. This took me into the fold of Islam. It's the same system that was given to Jesus, Moses, and the same thing asking you to worship one God and to follow a certain set of rules because the Creator knows the creation better than they know themselves. And if we follow what we do, okay, we're going to get into trouble. That's what ends up happening. So, to make a long story short, uh, I uh, started reading the Quran. When I started to read the Quran, I started to get rid of the bad habits that I have learned from this culture. And so, when I started to polish, when I started to get rid of these bad habits and that, I started to go to my wife with these things that were in her book. And uh, I kind of say we were at a crossroads. I was heading towards Islam and she was heading out of Islam. And so we kind of crossed paths at that point. She became, followed the bad parts of our culture, westernization. Uh, she removed her clothing, which is her modesty. Uh, and she started drinking alcohol, started doing all the bad things that are in this culture. And I wanted to get away from that because I saw the dangers of it. And this is why I talk to a lot of, the, especially the young Muslim youth, is because they're dealing with a lot of these issues in this culture. And not just Muslim youth, but all of our youth, because there's a lot of dangers in this society. So this is what at led me to Islam. Um, but it, it didn't bring out what Islam was for many years later. It was about five to six years later, and that was studying. And not just studying my own religion of Islam, but studying all the other religions. It sent me on a journey to actually look into faith a lot deeper. And I started to see one thing in common in every single religion I looked at, monotheism. Even in polytheistic faith, I found that there was one deity that was above all the others. It was pure monotheism. Now, Islam, it taught that same system, okay? But it taught it without people putting their own words in, without them adding things that contradict things that our human intellect have. And so when I started to look into all these things, I realized that there was one message that was given down to mankind. And all of the prophets, these were guides. And they were telling us to worship the one God that created us and to follow the commandments that he'd given us to help protect us. And, and that's the thing. He loves us. He wants us to get guidance in that. But we have to follow it and we have to look for the truth. And so that's what led me to Islam. And so a lot of people ask me that same question. And even sometimes uh, I get people online in that that say, if you don't like our, our society here, why don't, you, why don't you go to somewhere where you like something else? Yeah. And I start laughing and I say, listen, if I leave, what kind of human being would I be? If I did not speak out against this, if I did not try to change this for the better of my 
brothers and sisters in humanity, what good of a person am I if I go run away so I can go practice my Islam all by myself? What good am I? Not. Because it doesn't belong to me. You have to give it away. Freely. Here you go. I don't ask any payment for it. I don't ask for any recompense. All I ask is that if you fought, if you're a seeker of truth, a seeker of knowledge, then find a way. And that's why I always start with that book, because that book is amazing. That message, if it came down on a mountain, it would crumble it to dust. And that was the humility of these people when they started to think about the Lord that created them. And so that's what led me on that journey. And it's funny, because when I was growing up, I was not religious at all. I did not follow any religion. I, my parents were Roman Catholics by, by faith, but they were what I like to call Easter Catholics. Easter and Christmas Catholics. The rest of the year, nah. Okay, but on Easter and Christmas, they're there with their best dress on. And, and that's the way my family was. And so I used to question a lot of things in the Catholic religion and stuff, like intercessors in between priests and stuff like that. And none of the priests and none of the nuns could give me an honest answer. And that's all I was looking for, because God created us with an intellect to question things. That's who we are. As human beings, we're meant to question things. And so when you question these things, you expect an answer that's going to satisfy you. Okay? And you're going to keep on looking for this answer until you find the answer. And so that's what led me on that journey. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your job as a cleric for the Muslims in okay. the Minnesota Department of Corrections? Yes. And then Polly Mann was sharing with me on the right over here that Norway has a fabulous uh, prison system that's much different than here. Yes. So maybe she has a question after. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm the Islamic chaplain for the state of Minnesota. And so I work at the one in St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is the main intake prison of the state of Minnesota. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, there's approximately about 500 Muslim brothers that are, are, are incarcerated. Now, many of the brothers that are incarcerated in there, they have one key factor in it, which actually every single person that is in that prison has a key factor in it, and it's usually surrounding around alcohol. Okay? Alcohol is in 98% of all cases that are in that prison, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. So we have a problem with alcohol in this country. Okay? In Islam, alcohol is forbidden. And those that go against it, they're being deviant or they're, they're, they're sinning against themselves by consuming it. Okay? Um, and there's a reason behind this. Because there's an old saying that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, he said, alcohol is the mother of all shames. And it'll make a shame of you up to your mother. And that's true. Have you seen how people act when they get on alcohol? They do stupid things, right? They take off their clothes, they do very dumb things that it would be shameful in the sights of their mothers. But they think this is normal, okay? So there, there's a problem with this, and it takes time to go through this. Uh, the kids, the youth today, some of them, they have to go down this path in order to see that it's bad. And so what we do at the prison is that we educate them about the effects of alcohol, and we try to bring them back to the teachings that are in their book about why alcohol is forbidden. And I give them lessons about the people because in Saudi Arabia, before Islam, there was about 500 names for alcohol. In fact, the word alcohol is an Arabic word. Al-Kahal is an Arabic word. So they had over 500 names for alcohol, to call alcohol. And they had over 500 names to call horses. So anything that was important in a, in a society, they had lots of names for them. And so this is a problem with it. So what we do is we educate them and we try to work on the things that have gotten them there. Uh, the alcohol tried to get them back on the path of, you know, doing the right thing and being good citizens in this society because this is a big problem. Also, our prison system here in the United States is designed as a revolving door. Now, they can say all they want that they don't want these people in there, but I'm sorry, it's one of the largest businesses in the United States. It is. The U.S. prison system, the U.S. prison system, the only other company in the United States that is larger than it is Big Oil only other company. <laughs> I was in Houston, Texas, and I was dealing with a lot of people in the prison system there. And I mean, you had people that were in there 10 times, 10 times over a 20 year period. So every two years, they'd be going into prison. Now they make $200 a day off of each prisoner that is in there, yeah. $200 a day. So imagine that times 20,000, 20,000 in a correctional facility. So 
What they're saying and saying that it's a drain on our economy and in healthcare, this is all a big giant lie. This is a business. And they're trying to hide it because they need people to keep on putting them in there in order to keep that business open. Same thing with this war machine. This war machine. Our war machine here in the United States has gotten so large that they can't even disassemble it because of the amount of money that it generates. The U.S. government would collapse if it shut down. It would, because that's how much money it generates with this. And so they always have to search out a new enemy. If they don't have an enemy, how can they justify spending billions of dollars going and invading countries? And so we need to start looking into these things on where actually all the funding is coming from and what it is. So if anyone has any questions about that, I'm more than willing to take it. No. Here first, uh, matter? Go Either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> there you go. If you could uh, look in your crystal ball, could you t tell us what you think Obama's foreign policy might be if he's reelected? Can it get worse? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this is my opinion, okay? And that's all I'm saying is my opinion. Uh, it, there's no basis in fact or anything like that, and that's first I want to state that this is my own personal opinion. Um, I believe that the same, the same four-year policy that he has already created is going to be the same four-year policy that he's going. And I've stated before that this business of the war and stuff, it is a business. And so it's going to keep on going. And they're going to keep on finding enemies, and they're going to keep on pushing this agenda until they're stopped. Okay, and it's going to happen one day. It's going to, because everything has an end. Everything has a beginning and everything has an end. So eventually it's going to come to an end. But if I was going to say on that, my prediction on that with a crystal ball, I, I don't believe too much in predictions or that, but I say that it's going to go the same that it is because it's not really the president that's running things. It's the people behind the doors that are pulling the strings. And that's why they're doing a lot of the things now in politics where they're trying to bring contempt charges against the Department of Justice for not releasing documents. They want to go ahead and smear all of this stuff all over because they're upset because he's going against what they're saying. And, and that's the point. And that's happened to every single president of the United States since the very first one. If they go against the Congress and the Senate, which are the ones that are pushing all of this stuff, and as you can see, as you can see, they're being bought off by companies, corporations. And that's why certain laws are passed, and that's why it continues to oppress the hardworking people in the United States and around the globe, is because of this. Because these people are getting fat off of what other people are doing. And so th that's the point. And so I think it's going to keep on going the same way. Because you are speaking against the system of this country, I'm one of the 1%, I'm proud to say, and I don't see many more like me here. Yes, and, I and there's nothing wrong with this system, uh, and we need war, and we have enemies everywhere, everywhere. And, and so I can tell you that before communism, there was the, the uh, we had to be afraid of the Germans, and, the, and we had all those people, now we've got to be afraid of the terrorists. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that you're not one of the terrorists. So I just want to say beware, people, of all this stuff we're hearing here today about love and forgiveness and freedom. That is really dangerous stuff. I, on that, I, I, I love when people disagree with my opinions because this is, this, is, this is the beauty of this system that everyone has the right to an opinion, okay? And, and I agree with you, okay? And I'm not saying all one percenters, but not all one percenters, okay? There are some people that work very hard and their families work very hard to get where they are. Of those one percent, there are some of them that work very, very hard to get the wealth that they had. Okay? But there are some people that cheat and they abuse and they exploit the people in order to make the money off the backs of everyday Americans. And, and I'm serious. This happens corporation after corporation after corporation. I can go work a job for $8 an hour and they're making how much an hour? As they're putting out products? Well, some of them, they are something like 250 right. right. And are they doing as much work? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so it's not equal on that part, right? 
So, so that's the point. We, we need to have some equal justice, and that's why I said that. If we had a reinvestigation of 9-11 and found out the truth about the Muslim uh, 19 that supposedly crashed the airplanes and did all the terrible stuff, brought the towers down, if they find out that that was all a false story, how do you think that would change our relationship with Muslims throughout the world? That is a very good question. Um, and, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are going around on the internet and stuff like that, and you can watch a lot of, a lot of them. Um, me, I believe, I believe the facts that are in, okay, I just take it as it is because that's what we know is as, as what's been put out there. So I take that with a grain of salt. Now, whether they reinvestigate it and they found that it's some kind of big hoax or something or the government was involved in that, it doesn't matter because it was an act that was done and it's over with. 3,000 people died on that day, okay? It was a tragedy, okay? There was even Muslims that were in the Twin Cities, the Twin Towers that died when, the, when it came down. There was a firefighter that was among the ashes in that and even Congress in that said he was involved in it. And they cleared his name and they found out he was the firefighter that was the first on scene and he died, okay? So he was there. Because this is part of American values. Just because someone is a Muslim doesn't mean that they don't have American values. There are many Muslims that are here in this country and that, that accept this way of life. They, they love living here because they have the freedom to practice their Islam as it was meant to be. Okay? There are some countries that you go to where you cannot practice Islam how it's supposed to be. You will be locked up. And these are Muslim countries. Okay? Take, for example, Libya, which just fell. In Libya, Gaddafi, he locked up probably about 500 people in prison because they were handing out Qurans, which this is a Muslim country. Okay? You can do this in America, right? I can hand out Qurans, I can talk about Islam, I can do all of this stuff. So, parts of the system are very good. But, there are people that exploit parts of the system in order for their own benefit. And I, I don't think it will matter too much if they go ahead and reopen all this up or anything. I don't think it's going to change one bit. I think we need to have more dialogue and talk back and forth. I think that's the best thing to do. Yes. I hate, hate to push that, that same topic again, but I would like to say I, I, I disagree when you say it's over with, because the results of that, and I'm sure you know that, Nick knows that, everybody knows that, the result of that is a pretty oppressive society, and I'm, I'm not sure that learning more about it might make people more critical of the oppression that was on the society. And one other quick thing, because you mentioned corporations so much, we... Some of us from Grand Rapids are part of Move to Amend, and we brought a sign-up sheet on the back to to remove, to abolish corporate personhood, and to establish clearly that money is not speech. And we'd love for everybody here to go sign uh, our sheet there. I, I agree on the last part. Uh, we need to do more with that because right now there is something that is going on in American politics that has never gone on before. Elections are being bought. And it's not just here, it's happening in Europe, it's happening everywhere. Money is going around and they're buying for their interest. And this is very dangerous, especially in democratic societies. And so that's something that needs to be wary of. Now, on the other aspect, okay, for example, if 3,000 people die, okay, does it justify 3 million people dying? No, okay? If one person does something in the name of something, can we hold the whole entire religion accountable? No. And that is what is happening. You have, every time you hear the word Islam in the media, what do you hear along with it? Terrorism. Okay? Even some Muslims, okay, today, even the youth in that, they're, de they're dealing with identity crisis here in America because every single word they hear out of the media is terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. Okay? And they're Muslims, they're kids. What do they know about any of this stuff? Nothing. But now you sat there and you've abused the kid, these kids. I have a license plate on my car that says Islam for you because I educate people about Islam. Everywhere I go, I have people that will go ahead and flick up the finger, and sit there and try to run me off the road and that. And I, there's a fear, okay? Using fear to subjugate people is wrong, no matter what it is, okay? And in order to get an agenda to go ahead and do, do this, to go into other countries and kill people is wrong, no matter what, okay? Period. And so I don't justify that. What happened that day, every single Muslim will agree. There's a ayat, a verse in the Quran that says, if you kill one person, it's like you killed all of humanity. 
And if you save one person, it's like you saved all of humanity. And God is all aware and wise. He knows all of this. And so that's what we say. Islam doesn't justify killing of anything. In fact, life is very, very valuable in Islam. Blood, even of non-Muslims being spilled, is a grave offense in the sights of Almighty God. And so that's part of our teachings. These people, because they hijacked Islam, and they want to say that, hey, we're Islam, and we want to do jihad, and we want to kill all the infidels that they say all of this stuff, this is all a bunch of garbage. This is all a bunch of garbage. Okay, crackpots. Just like, it, I mean, you never see in the news media a Christian terrorist, right? No. Never. You never, and there's many of them, right? Yes, there are. There, there are many of them. I, I agree with that one, too. But that, that's the point. We have to be careful because there's a, a media influence that's going on that is using semantics to confuse people. And Islam is not the enemy. The enemy lies within. And that is true. The enemy lies inside each and one, every one of us that we don't do research. We become complacent. We, we follow what has been put out on the media instead of doing the research ourselves and looking what the truth is. So... believe would be a just solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, we have to go all the way back in history to Abraham, peace be upon him. Abraham, peace be upon him, is the father of all religions. Okay? His two sons, his oldest son Ishmael, and his younger son Isaac. Okay? Almighty God made a pact with him and said, your children shall inherit the earth. And today that, that promise has come true. Three quarters of the population, okay, of the whole entire globe attribute themselves to Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Those three. Ishmael gave birth to the Arab tribes and Islam, and Isaac gave birth to the Jewish tribes and Christianity. And so, literally, they're brothers, okay? The Jews and the Muslims are brothers, right next to one another. Okay. What do brothers do? An older brother and a younger brother? They fight, right? Can anybody get in the middle of that and try to uh, fix that? No. They have to work it out themselves. And actually before 1948, Israel, the Israelis, and the Palestinians, they ate together in the same homes. They ate together just like brothers in the same home. In fact, they even married one another. But what you did is you created a secular state that created division between the two people. You're seeing the same thing happening in Nigeria. In Nigeria, Muslims and Christians were together. They married together. Now they created a secular state. Now the Christians and the Muslims are now fighting. They're divided, right? So this is what has happened with this. And so there's no solution to it. There's no solution to it. The only one that has the solution are the ones that are involved in it. No diplomat from outside can fix it. I can't fix it. None of us can fix it. Only Almighty God and the two that are involved in it. I, I just want to mention one thing to you. Sure. And I may have misunderstood you, but there certainly is no equality between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It's a very one-sided battle over there. And the Israelis are killing the, the Israeli mothers. Some of them are throwing garbage down on the, on the uh, Palestinian children that live below them. Uh, it's a very one-sided issue. And this government supports Israel. We give them, I think, six billion dollars a year or something like that at some point in that neighborhood. So it is a one-sided and we are very much a part of it. And I don't know how we're going to solve it either. Um, it's actually going to take American people that actually care about this issue to stand up to their legislators. Because here, here's the thing, even if you stand up to your legislators with this, okay, they're doing underground stuff to do this also because they're the one that built the state in the first place. Well, okay. the Jews themselves in this country Tremendous right. and those right. people, and there are some here who just have that situation right. like what I do, but they're not here anymore. Right. And, and also, you see a one sided media flip on that, also. So, they always, when you see in the media and that, you'll see the Palestinians as the aggressor, and you see the Israelis as the defensive ones that are over here. Even though they have all the tanks, all the planes, and the guns, and everything, and they have nothing but rocks. Exactly. Right. You're right. And, and so, this is the point. But most people are deceived by this. Most people are deceived by this, and only a few people can see through this. And, and, and that's the whole point. When you start to expose the faults of the system, okay, you can change the system. But if we sit here and we go, well, what can we do? There's nothing we can do. Um, it's out of our control. We're not congressmen. We're not senators. We're not politicians. Okay, what ends up happening? 
Nothing. Yes. 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 Well, thank you. Any other questions? Huh? Okay. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you. Thank you, Jamal. That was wonderful. I feel uh, about ten times smarter now than ever before, especially about about Islam. Uh, we're going to be breaking for lunch now, but here's what we're going to do. Uh, we have a slight change in plans. We're going to ask everyone to get your plates and find a comfortable place to sit. And then Derek Amley, who has to leave uh, shortly, is going to uh, speak to us while we eat. Um, so let me tell you before you start filling your plates, uh, Derek is a graduate of West Point and uh, has a very interesting perspective on war in the military. So I know you'll want to hear what he has to say, so let's try to eat quietly and enjoy his talk. Thank you.